six. Thanks, Liz. Daniel chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold round his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face towards the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I'm overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I'm helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the Book of Truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince, and in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Keep your texts open in front of you. Thank you so much for reading that. My hope today, guys, is that we can be shown from scripture what it means to really pray. Uh, what the Apostle Paul called, I guess, praying in the Spirit, which was his instruction to a church in Ephesus, which he could see, I guess, floundering against some cosmic forces. And not only would this praying in the Spirit, really praying, enable them to stand firm, but would enable them to get on the front foot of God's purposes, not just for their life, but for the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom. I've chosen January 10, don't ask me why, it's totally crazy, but I hope that it too will give you a clearer vision of history changing prayer. Above all, I hope it gives you a bigger view of who Jesus is 
and who you are in him. Guys, it's always brave just to land in the middle of a book like Daniel. All sorts of stuff is going on. So just by way of context, very quickly, Daniel is in exile. If you don't know what that means, he's been driven away from his birth land and his spiritual home. He lived under two major empires and their gods. That theological point is made continuously in Scripture. The pressure Daniel faced to renounce his God, the Lord, was enough to credit him with just keeping the faith. But Daniel too was able to get on the front foot of God's purposes, not only for his life, but for the precious people that he pleaded for before the Lord. So we're going to go in into Daniel 10, to see how Daniel prayed, what was happening as he prayed, and what this all means for you and me today. I've got a few slides. The first one, starting from verse 2, we know it's a difficult situation. We know Daniel is struggling with the, the continual sense that this is not resolving and Daniel at that time mourned for three weeks. He says, I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks are over. Guys and girls, when it comes to prayer, Jesus' last encouragements to the disciples are very instructive. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's always true, and we take note of three things in these opening verses. To pray powerfully the kinds of prayers that make a real difference, we see three things that have to be set aside in order to make way for the Spirit. Our comfort, our treats, and our time. So we see Daniel conceding his comfort. Look with me here in verse 2. Daniel mourned. He was totally realistic about the totally tragic times that he lived in and the confusion of it dragging on so long. And my encouragement to you, dear friends, is this. Stay in the game. It is very tempting to retreat, to disengage emotionally from the pain that is out there, to turn off the news, to wrap ourselves and distance ourselves from the pain and to shut our front doors to put the world to rights, but not emotionally engage with what's happening. Daniel mourns, and that is a gateway into praying in the spirit. We see Daniel buffeting his body. Bit of an old fashioned word, it's the word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 9. Look at the spelling, check the pronouncement. It's buffeting, not buffeting. Okay, so buffeting your body has the opposite effect of buffeting your body. But as I look at my prayer life and I ask you about yours, do you see that often our body is at the beck and call of our knickknacks, our phones, our late TV shows and our lions? Phil's perhaps looking at that and going, how did he go three weeks without lotions? <laughs> you look great, Phil. But we see Daniel 2 taking the time. There's a sacrifice of time for those who would devote themselves to prayer. It sounds obvious, but we know the rhythm of Daniel's prayer from chapter 6. He prays three times a day. When I first came to faith, I don't know what it was, but I was drawn in lunchtimes to go into my local church. You just sit there in the pews and pour out my heart before the Lord. And it's not just about the regularity of prayer, but how long you pray for. Daniel is praying about the th same thing here for three weeks. And I want to make clear to you guys, it is not the sacrifices that make the prayers powerful. There is no power in setting the alarm clock at 6 a.m. or going without wine for a week. It's the quality of the prayers which seem to be only achievable by such sacrifices that make them powerful. So I leave you with a question. What's the quality of your prayer times like? The quality. 
How much are they limited, cut short, infrequent because of your flesh? What sacrifices have you made recently to devote yourself more continually to prayer, to really pray? I leave that with you and the Holy Spirit and we will go on because we need to know if we are to pray like this and sacrificially devote ourselves that our prayers actually move the hand of God. Okay, we're we're skipping a bit here. We're actually going to verse 12. I'm going to come in and fill in some of this weird stuff in the middle in a moment. But just check out these words. Verse 12. The angel has arrived, Daniel's messenger, and said, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before the Lord, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. Brothers and sisters, Prayer is not simply a therapeutic exercise. I understand the sentiment of Christian cliches like we don't pray to change God, we pray to change ourselves. I understand that. I understand the post by J. John recently that said we do not pray to twist the hand of God but to hold the hand of God. I get it. God is unchanging. He does not need your counsel. We cannot overrule God and Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done. But God wants you to partner with him. Our relationship with God and history is far more dynamic than we would dare to believe. The language is clear. Since the first day that you set your mind to prayer, we will look at those words, Your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. I understand. I was saved by grace. And I think we are so anti-works when it comes to God saving us that, that once we are saved, we don't believe that anyone but God can have any effect in anything. And when it comes to our prayer life and our mission life, it, it, it's like we are a child sat on daddy's seat while he drives. I don't know if you ever did that game with your dad giving you the impression that you're actually doing something, but you're not. He's driving. That's not what this says. My friends, one day you are going to sit on one of Yahweh's thrones and judge angels. So don't you think that your preparation for that day might involve a smidgen of actual responsibility and influence? Yes. So from the thrust of scripture, here's my advice for you. Stop praying about things. Pray for things. Pray until you get the answer. I can't help but think of Acts 12 here. If you remember the early church, James, the brother of John, has been slain by the sword. And then Peter, Peter is taken into prison. It doesn't say that the church prayed about it. Yeah, we really should pray about that. It says they prayed for Peter. And we know from the story that they prayed until he arrived at their front door. Until they got the answer. The answer with James was sadly his demise. The answer was Peter was that an angel would miraculously save him from prison, walk him out into the streets, and he'd appear at their front door knocking. They were so surprised, but they were still praying. My friends, pray for Pray until. The next verse here, we're going to look at it in a moment, says that Daniel's angel was on his way for 21 days until the answer came. Daniel prayed for how long? Three weeks. Anyone good at maths? Can you see the link? It begs the question, doesn't it? What if Daniel had given up praying on day 20? What might we have given up praying for just before we might have seen God's hand move? If you want to hear someone really praying, we go back a chapter, verse 9, verse 17. 
Now, O oh God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favour on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O oh God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We don't make requests because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Do you pray like that? Not all prayers are spiritual prayers. Not all prayers are faith-filled prayers. Not all prayers are really praying at all. My question for you, brothers and sisters, is this. What have you set your mind on? What are you praying for? What are you praying until you get your answer? Why all this effort? Well, when we do go on to verse 13, the horizons expand. He says this, crazy talk. The prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there by the king of Persia. What on earth is he talking about? Now, the prince or king of Persia here isn't a human monarch. It just isn't. The text makes that plainly clear, just as Michael, the one that comes to his aid, is not an earthly prince of Daniel's. We know who Michael is. Who is he? The archangel. Now, whoever this dark geographical force is, he's able to oppose Daniel's spiritual messenger, who, by the way, is pretty awesome himself. Yes, until Michael is tagged in and then the wrestling match tips in the favour of the good guys. But what do we do with all of this? Well, we need to get our spiritual lenses on, only as far as scripture will permit. And we need to understand what Daniel, Jesus, Jesus' followers and Paul assumes we know the supernatural worldview of the Bible. Now, I'm very brave in doing this. It's a massive rabbit hole. I've produced a handout for anyone who wants to know more or check my references. We're going to have a whistle-stop tour of the Bible's outline of the spiritual realm. They are called the sons of God. Yes, it includes angels, but that is a small part of it. Yes, it includes the devil, but he's just one figure. We're talking about the Elohim in Hebrew, God's lowercase g, of which Paul said, of course, there are many. We like to avoid all of this because of our post-enlightenment Western materialistic worldview. Are you ready? I'm just going to race through this. I don't want you to take it all in. I just want you to go, whoa, I didn't realize that and I need to get on my knees. Number one, these gods, Elohim, spiritual beings, were made in God's image before humans were part of his original family. So like humans, these spiritual beings were given real governing authority. Number two, this heavenly realm is complex, but it's simplified in scripture as having three tiers. The administrative layer, where the messengers and the angels are, Yahweh in the third heavens with his cher throne, cherubim and seraphim and guardians. And then in the middle and passing through in a very complex way, this ruling family of principalities, authorities, powers, hosts, glorious ones, archangels, heavenly council. It's all through scripture. Number three, no other spiritual being is equal to God, capital G. No spiritual being, lowercase g, is to be worshipped like the one creator God. Nor are they to be fooled around with, because as Paul says, they're real. Number four, many spiritual beings rebelled. There's three fools in Genesis 1 to 11, and they fell, like humans, because of pride, because of lust, and actually jealousy of God's human family. They left their assigned places, but like human rebels, you and me, their ruling status was not taken away and they can still cause carnage like you and me. Number five, 17 nations were scattered when? Babel. 
God handed those nations over to the spiritual governance of these sons of God. Deuteronomy 32, read it. With the exception of one nation, who was it? Israel. His portion, which he would rule theocratically <laughs> until the time of the kings, with at least Michael as an archangel delegated to the task. Number six, don't take all of this in. God wasn't finished with the nations. He commissioned Israel to bring them back into his family on two conditions, as long as Israel cleared all the spiritual debris out of their own land, including the giants, that's a massive rabbit hole. Condition number two, that they didn't mix with the gods beyond the border. But they failed. And the nations, under their gods, attacked again and again, often from the north, where the prince of Baal ruled, in Hebrew, Baal Zebul, Baal Zebul, beginning to sound familiar. Jesus, number seven, was born. When Jesus was born by the Virgin and the Holy Spirit, Revelation 12 says that all the heavens and spiritual beings went into uproar, good and bad. All the spiritual beings knew who he was, but not how he would win his people back. He concealed that secret from the good and the bad. Number eight, Jesus accepted worship as the unique highest spiritual being himself. John 10 got him into a lot of trouble. He then led his followers, Israel, to the borders, often north, looking towards Bashan, Baal's territory, with the promise that the spiritual gates facing them would not hold the church out. His spirit-empowered church would reverse Babel and retrieve the nations. Number nine, we're nearly there. At the cross, praise God, the bulls of Bashan and all dark powers were disarmed and humiliated. They'd thought they'd got him by puppeteering the Romans and religious elite, but Jesus proclaimed his victory to disobedient spiritual beings in his death. He was risen by the Holy Spirit to the place above all spiritual rule. There Jesus raided Bashan for their spiritual gifts and gave them to his human sons of God, the church, who by praying in his spirit would begin their preparation for sitting themselves on Yahweh's highest thrones. Number 10. Today, despite their fate and fatal blow, dark demonic powers remain the puppeteers of all geopolitical, societal and religious unrest, backsliding and persecution. And they will be until finally cast into the lake of fiery sulfur with the false prophets that they inspire. Okay. The next verse in chapter 10 says that Daniel fell into a sleep. He can't take it in. He's totally overwhelmed. And that's how we feel. But I need you to consider this. Here is Daniel in relation to his spiritual messenger, about here. Okay, there's his body, topaz, lightning, torches, bronze, face of a multitude. Here's Daniel. No strength, deathly pale, helpless, probably five foot nine and a half. Consider this. But that spiritual messenger, on his own, was not able to overcome the evil personality that he was up against over Persia. So presumably, under normal circumstances, Persia's ruling spirit was much more than a match for Daniel as well. Does that make sense? So here's the question. Where do you think that puts you and me in relation to the dark spiritual forces over the UK who don't want our prayers answered for our nation, our city, our churches, our neighbours. I'll tell you where it puts you, in one of two places. Either at the bottom of the pile, impotent, helpless, with our doubtful, fleeting, praying about it attitude, <laughs> dribbling down our chins and dripping off the spiritual ceiling above, making zero difference with our prayers. Or by submitting the flesh, 
praying constantly for that thing that you know the Lord has set in your mind until receiving it, because you know in his spirit from Christ's throne, your answer is only a matter of time. If you were to look at your prayer life now and how you really pray, what is the likely outcome of your prayers? Are they making any difference at all, given what we're up against? If you feel at all like Daniel, poor Daniel, you will need to know that God's love and strength have won out. Daniel said, how can I, your servant, even talk to you anymore? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. As we said at the start, it's amazing sometimes that Daniel even kept the faith. And when we open our hearts and our front doors to the pain and the mess that is around there, when we engage with it emotionally, when we really pray for things and set our mind on things in that spiritual battle, we will run out of our own usual resources. This journey began for me when I was on the mission field myself, when day after day I was faced with situations which were too, tad, too sad, too desperate for me as a human to know I could do anything about it. And suddenly my prayer life looked very, very meager. And then one day I was contacted by a lady she wasn't a believer of Jesus, but she asked me to pray for her because she'd lost two babies. And I said, of course, I will pray about it. And as I said those words, I will pray about it. Jesus said to me, no, pray for it. So I started really praying. Put aside food, lions and I started really praying and I really held God's promises up towards him and said your reputation is on the line here I never prayed like it before <laughs> two weeks later she called and said the pregnancy is going really well I kept on praying two weeks later she said the doctors called us in and it doesn't look good I said look I'm going to keep praying for this and you must too she got to the doctors and she was told that the baby had died there was no heartbeat, and they arranged an operation for the baby to be removed from her womb. Again, Jesus said to me, stop praying about it, pray for it. And I prayed, and I really prayed, and I prayed with her. She went in for the operation, and the doctor said, we need to do another scan, because it was another doctor who checked before, so I know what I'm doing. Scan said, well, we won't be operating today because the baby's alive. I couldn't believe it. I've never had a prayer like that answered before in my life. A few weeks later, the baby died. And this time, earthly, wise, not heavenly, that was the end. Now, I went on a walk for an hour and a half and I really prayed. And when I say before I really prayed, I realized again, perhaps I hadn't been really praying. And I really prayed to God. And I said, how on earth is this lady going to come to faith now? We've been asking her to pray about this. We've been praying in your name. What is going on? And I prayed and I prayed. And as I prayed, I could feel something rising within me. And it wasn't just anger. It was the spirit of God. Anyway, I didn't speak to her for two weeks. She was in the middle of an alpha course. And I didn't want to invite her to the next alpha episode. I thought that was totally irrelevant. And I came into prayer one day at church. And she was sat in the corner with a friend of mine with a big smile on her face. I said, lovely to see you. I didn't expect to see you. What's going on? And my friend nudged her and said, tell him. And she said, I've given my life to Jesus. It wasn't all the answer. But the Lord was showing me some answers. Over the next few weeks, she started up our first mother and toddlers group in Whitley the state where I used to live in the north of Plymouth and she set up a baby corner uh, where the mums would sit with all of her tots and she'd mix with the mums and, and with the kids. One of the kids was disabled, uh, shouldn't have lived and probably will not live past the age of eight and she offered to work uh, for the mum to give her some respite to look after the toddler. Last week we found out that that mum has come to faith in Jesus. I tell you this story 
because it is absolutely exhausting to really pray, to really care, to really plead and petition the Lord on his promises for a kingdom that is both now and not yet. And what is so beautiful about this verse, which is repeated twice in 10 and 18, is that the Lord knows that we need to be ministered to as we minister to others in prayer. Twice. We need to hear it again and again. You who are highly esteemed. And he ministers to Daniel in such a beautiful way. Stand up, stand up, stand up. I will leave this with you. I asked you a question earlier. What have you set your mind on in prayer? And I'm going to end with an infinitely more important question. What has the Lord set his mind on? The answer is you. You must let Psalm 8 minister to you. He is so mindful of you. He never died for an angel. He never redeemed a God. He never forgave a spiritual being. He never indwelt one. He never lifted one of them onto his throne, not just to play, but to take part. But he does you. And if you let that minister to you twice as much as you plead to him on behalf of others, the quality, power and perseverance of your prayers will go through the roof. Submit your flesh. Praise the Lord in all his fullness of who he is and where he is. Confess your sins and affirm your own allegiance in the cosmic battle and then plead to God. Pray for, brothers and sisters, pray until, my friends. And then most importantly, and this is the bit I'm learning, believe. Believe. Consider his love and power until your faith rises, the spirit comes and the prayers take on a life of their own. Until you remember that you're not twisting God's arm or moving it against his preference because in his mercy and grace, he thinks much of you. And one day he'll have you ruling over the heavens yourself. Let us pray. Father God, before we intercede for this city, for your nation, for your church, we thank you for Jesus. And each of us now make a resolution to pray better quality prayers. Each of us now knowing our place in you and our partnership with you, pray for, pray until we see something of your kingdom in and around us in the brokenness, hurt and mess and pain which we will allow ourselves to feel. We make that resolution with you now, Lord, knowing that you are faithful and you will do it and you will sanctify our whole body, spirit and mind to be blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.